1988, 1988, Mike Ponson, Mike Ponson. PTRPG Cyberpunk, Cyberpunk, and introduced us to a world where well-heeled corpos shaped the city to their whim with impunity, pitting booster gangs of chromed-out street samurais against one another, and edge runners struggled to survive by their wits and implants in a ruthlessly violent town called Night City. The TTRPG is now in its fifth edition, Cyberpunk Red. Cyberpunk 2077 from CD Projekt Red is a hit game that advances that storyline some 32 years farther into the future to a rebuilt, reformed, fully chromed out Night City of Tomorrow. And now, a hit anime on Netflix, Cyberpunk Edge Runners, which follows the violent, desperate exploits of David Martinez and his crew of Chumbas. So, chip in, Chumbas. We're doing another Cyberpunk drink today on HTD, the David Martinez. Cyberpunk Edge Runners. Honestly, I would not have known that this show had come out at all, except for the fact that I started getting all these comments asking me for a David Martinez. Probably because I did these two other drinks from Cyberpunk, the Jackie Wells and the Johnny Silverhand, uh, two of the more popular episodes I've done. I, I should probably just keep doing Cyberpunk stuff. It's a great show. Um, I'm not really huge on anime, to be perfectly honest, and I did watch it in dubbed. I watched it dubbed, and I know a lot of purists out there are just shaking their heads in disgust right now. You gotta watch the, the subtitles. I don't... I don't got time for that. It does not pull punches. This show, I guess it's TV, so it's M, but I think it would be like NC-17, It's uh, or X. It's, it's a horny, violent psycho show. It's some wild shit, man. So now there's a drink in Cyberpunk 2077 called a David Martinez, which you can get at the Afterlife. The in-game recipe for a David Martinez is a shot of vodka and a splash of knee cola. Nicola is a soft drink that exists in the 2077 timeline. It is reportedly probably the most popular soft drink in Night City. It is imported from Japan and it comes in four varieties. So first things first, I'm gonna make all four versions of Nicola. Then I'm going to use that to create a David Martinez. And I felt like I should probably start with classic. They don't describe that anywhere in the game. I asked Twitter, as one does. I got a lot of really useful, interesting responses. Artel Saurian Games responded. They are the publishers of Cyberpunk, Mike Ponsmith's company. They said it would taste like cough syrup without the medicinal benefits. I appreciate that. I may have to chart my own course here because cough syrup is tricky, especially when we have to do four different flavors. So I looked at the name and I thought about it. I was like, you know, it's called Knee Cola. Cola. It's gotta be to some degree recognizable as a cola. This is it right here. This is my knee cola syrup. Now, Coca-Cola, if you wanted to make real accurate Coca-Cola, it is a time consuming, expensive process with a lot of ingredients. I didn't do that. And I wouldn't want to do that anyway, because that's Coca-Cola. We're making knee cola. End of the day, what I do know about Coca-Cola is that it is primarily, whether you realize this or not, a citrus flavored thing. The primary ingredients in Coca-Cola are like lemons, limes, and oranges. Everything else, actually, there's like other forms of citrus. There are some nut extracts. There is, of course, cola in it, but my understanding is that cola does not taste like Coca-Cola. It's the source of caffeine, actually. So I made this syrup and it made for a pretty good soft drink, but it was missing a little bit of bite. And I had this idea. We recently did an episode on how to make the best gin and tonic you'd ever have in your life. And I followed Jeffrey Morgenthaler's plan to do that. I had to make chinchola bark extract. I'm going to put a link in the pin comp below. We'll put it up here in the corner. Beep, boop, beep, boop. Check it out. And I really thought it woke the syrup up. It like put a little snappy bite of bitterness in it. It doesn't bring it to a place where it becomes a bitter drink at all. It was just, just a snappy little bite that was missing. Snappy little bite. But it used very little again. So to 749 grams of syrup, I added five grams of this. And now we've got our syrup, which what makes, which what makes. That which what makes the syrup. This is my serum, which hut is good for making knee cola. This is the <laughs> syrup that makes knee cola. I find that a blend of about two parts club soda to one part knee cola syrup will yield a very nice soft drink. I'm gonna use this to make myself a glass of knee cola classic right after this. If you're a serious nerd, there's going to be a very long conversation about cyberpunk and genre at the end of this video. So stick around or skip ahead using the time codes below. That was long. 
I can't put that at the beginning of the episode, but it's cool stuff. So I want to keep it somewhere. So anyway, let's make finally Nicola Classic. It's two to one. So whatever you want to do is fine. I'm going to do a two ounce pour of my syrup and I'm going to do a four ounce pour of club soda. I don't know, you might be able to shave that ratio up a little bit, but like if you've ever made cola from like cola syrup, if you've ever been a soda jerk in the 19, why at the old soda counter down there with the paper hat, it's a lot of syrup to make a Coke. And that's why Coca-Cola has so much sugar in it. We're gonna, whoa, whoa. I was gonna add more carbonation to it, but I think it's ready. Uh, that's pretty good. That's, that's nice, that's nice. So I probably could free pour it, but I like to measure things, so. I'm just gonna mix the soda and the syrup together a little bit and then lower an ice cube. There we go. And that is a knee cola. Now it's probably not the color you think cola should be. Um, that's always done with like caramel coloring or something like that. It's not a natural color. I left mine natural because I thought there was no real reason not to. If you wanted to color this anything you wanted to, it'd be easy. That is so fucking good. It comes in with a very, very pleasant, sweet lemon lime citrus flavor with the lemons, the limes, and oranges. And then that fades into a very subtle, snappy little bite. I don't know, because I want to say bitter, but I feel like you're going to read that the wrong way. It is a very subtle bitterness, but it's so subtle. You know, it's so subtle. It's barely more than just like the, the sensation of carbonation, but it does add this beat of evolution. It does add this contrast to the sweetness. And I honestly, I think that recipe I came up with puts it in fantastic balance. It is a perfect ratio for what that would be, you know? Uh, maybe you could edge it one way or the other a little bit for preference, but without it, it felt too sweet. I know for certain, because I've played with gentian a lot, if I added any more than just the right amount, it would be like, eh, this is too much. Earthy then. This isn't that. Another great question I just thought of for you to ask me virtually in your mind. Why aren't you making these as cocktails? Well, because I've done this before, right? I did um, the Call of Duty uh, Perca Colas, right? And we did those as cocktails. They were beverages with alcohol in them. I'm doing a cocktail based on a soft drink. And so my alcohol is vodka there. And I don't want that soft drink to be a hard drink. In addition to that, I thought it'd be really fun to make these as soft drinks, you know, to actually make them real soft drinks. So that's what I wanted to do. So to that end, all of these are going to be like infusions and syrups of things that are non-alcoholic. I will say this, there's in the extract for our chinchona, this started out as 80 proof vodka and then five grams in a 750 milliliter bottle. I mean, there's, it's not, legally speaking, it is not alcoholic. It is an undetectable amount of alcohol, I'm sure. You would need like a mass proton x-ray spectrometer or something like that to find it. That's a delicious soft drink. It would sell. It would go well on shelves. So the next one I made, Nicola Fire. I had to make a decision about what is Nicola Fire. So a lot of times when fire is in the name, it means that it's going to be cinnamony, you know, and it just was so expected. So the other way to go with that would be like to make it actually hot and spicy. And I'd never tried anything like this. I, this is a cayenne and chipotle syrup. I'll tell you what, it was good. I'm going to make a knee cola fire right now. So to do that, we're going to do one ounce of fire syrup. And this one does pour pretty thick. As much filtering as I did, it still has a little bit of pulp and granulates and particulates in there, and that will make a syrup thick. Now I want half an ounce of Nicola Classic. Classic. For that classic Nicola flavor. Nicola! And now I need twice that. So that's an ounce and a half of syrup. So I need three ounces of bubble water. And you know, you could free pour this, but you might, <laughs> you might wanna take care to get these ratios pretty carefully correct, right? It's gonna, if you free pour all this, if you just make it up as you go, you're gonna get a different result every time. And that's fine. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that, but like for my purposes, I kind of want to have some consistency here on the show. And I'm just going to drop this ice cube in there. And that is Nicola Fire. You know, actually, wait, look at that. That's fantastic looking. We got a real fizzy popping head on there. I'm pretty happy with that. Okay, here we go. Ooh, yeah. It immediately hits your nose in a pleasant way with a smoky, spicy aroma. It's sweet. And then you get this swelling fire. Now I'm not really big on spicy things, but this is right on the edge for me. Pretty not that spicy by comparison. It's still got plenty of kick in it. I think that it would go really well with bitters. The one thing I want to stop though and say is like, look, you look at that and you say, nobody's going to make, nobody is going to put on the market a soft drink called fire that isn't red. 
And the truth of the matter is that like while there are certain natural powders and things like that, that you can add to something to add redness to it, none of them are gonna work quite as good as plain old red food coloring. And frankly, we're talking about a soft drink that's a mass marketed soft drink here. And I'm not trying to upscale it, I'm trying to make it. I don't know why I wouldn't just use a little food coloring. So I'll put a few drops of food coloring in there and we'll mix that in. There you go. Now that's neat cola fire, right? I think so. Should I have used grenadine or something? Absolutely not. Uh, you know, it would be the wrong choice here. I'm gonna throw in, just out of curiosity, I wanna put in a little bit of bitters just to see what that does to it. I got a funny feeling it's gonna pair well. I love what that does to it, holy shit. That puts a whole nother dimension into it, uh, as bitters do. Um, and it pairs really well. It brings in a cinnamon note. It brings in other spices into the mix. Now we're gonna do Nicola Sakura. So Sakura is cherry blossoms. It's not cherries, it's not cherry flavor. It's cherry blossom flavor. That was tricky. And I said that I came to the idea of doing this episode like two days ago or a day ago. I immediately looked into Sakura and started ordering ingredients for that. I got a few things. I got several pouches of this Sakura powder and one bottle of this cherry blossom elixir. This just showed up before we started rolling, so I have no idea if this is any good. This is Japanese Sakura powder. As far as I can tell, it is nothing more than powdered dried cherry blossoms. That's it. Although it does have a flavor when we made a syrup with it, it is not as punchy as some of these other flavors we're working with. So I started this approach two different ways. I made an extract using 90 grams of vodka that I threw six grams of Sakura powder into, and then I stirred them up really good, and then I immediately transferred them to a coffee filter, and I let it drip for a very long time until it was clear, and it's funny because this powder's pretty pink, but the vodka turned it white. It stole everything from it, and that extract is here, and I love how just electrically pink that is. It should be shelf-stable just like our Chin Sona extract is. I also made a Sakura syrup, uh, which is here. Here's the thing we just noticed before we started filming. This stuff must have a lot of pectin in it or something because this turns into a gel. There are ways to solve that problem. <laughs> it looks literally like jello in there, it's so funny. That are not things I can do on the fly and I wanna get this episode done. For now, we're gonna pretend that it's a lot like um, Coco Lopez, the uh, cream of coconut stuff. And you gotta warm it up and shake it up because it will reliquify if we just like really move it around a lot. One ounce of this syrup. One thing I will say is that this extract is a hell of a lot less potent than this. That's just down to the fact that cinchona bark and cherry blossoms are worlds apart in terms of flavor intensity. So it's gonna be five bar spoons approximately. A bar spoon is about equal, or at least this bar spoon is about equal to gram of liquid. So now I want two ounces of soda. And now you can take that ratio and expand it any way you want. I don't think this one needs any additional color. I think that the color we get is actually quite nice. I mean, I guess you could add color to it if you really wanted to, but I think that that looks like a rose colored beverage. I'm gonna throw a little ice in there. And you know, any of these can be used to make other highballs if you wanted to make like a uh, kind of a Collins with this. I think it'd be cool. That tastes like nothing I've ever had. That is a, I said rose, it is rose colored, but it's a cherry blossom soda pop. You know, I don't know what cherry blossoms would actually smell like. I don't imagine them to be very fragrant flowers. If I had to say what it tastes like, it probably does taste a little bit like roses. It's not like potpourri. It's not like overly floral at all. It is very pleasant. It's also a much more subtle flavor than both of the other variations here on our knee cola. Mmm. Oh, what is, it's um, it, it reminds me a little bit of like some kind of fruit or melon, a little watermelon maybe, I don't know. It is maybe like orange blossom water meeting some rose blossom water in a specific ratio or something. Bringing me to my final version of Nicola. Let's make our Nicola Blue. Now Nicola Blue, I have to assume, is what's called for in a David Martinez. That's why I left it for last. There's a picture of this drink in the game. It's a small, low bitmap. So it's kind of hard to see it very, very well, but it's definitely blue. So vodka isn't blue. So I'm thinking it's a Nicola blue. In America, it'd probably be blue raspberry, right? But that's boring. I don't want to do another blue raspberry anything, but I need this drink to be blue. I needed there to be, it had to be blue flavored. So I thought to myself, hey, butterfly pea blossoms are blue. They don't taste like anything, but we're already doing Sakura, which is edible flowers, right? That's cherry blossoms. Let me do a quick Google search for edible Japanese flowers. And I found a couple of websites selling cherry blossoms right next to violets, edible violets. I don't know how much 
cuisine or tea or whatever in Japan commonly contains violets or cherry blossoms for that matter. But I know that it seems like it sometimes does, that there's at least a little bit of a basis for this. So I'm gonna make a violet soda. But I also had to make it today, and I didn't have time to get the ingredients I want. I couldn't get those flowers. So what did I do? Well, we got in the car and we drove around. The one thing I know that's violet that you can find somewhere around these violet candies that nobody likes. But we bought 10 packages of these <laughs> uh, because I knew that they were made of violet. And they taste like violet and i'm going to open this one up and give it a taste i think these are like one of those candies that have been around for like 200 years or something choward's violets nothing is pleasant about these they're like eating chalk hard crunchy chalk chalk that turns into soap i gotta rinse out my mouth with water so i had to make a syrup from that one nice thing about that too is that like those are you're gonna find those if you really want them you can make this without needing to order special ingredients hell we'll put a link in the pin and comment below to amazon i'm sure you can find them on amazon i will say that this stuff worked it, it tastes like violets, strongly. There's probably something in those violet candies that is causing this stuff to coagulate. There's probably a better way to do it. Like I said, I'm flying by the seat of my pants. The recipe to turn this into a soda is gonna be one ounce of the violet syrup. Now I wanna take half an ounce of the Nicola Original. So now I'm gonna add three ounces of club soda, or carbonated water, whatever you wanna call it. I'm going to stir that together. And that is Nicola Blue. Um, not blue yet though. That is still so good, actually. I really like that. Again, Nicola Blue should be blue, right? Oh, God, look at this. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. Wait a minute, this is a problem. That'll never come out. You rubbing alcohol or nail polish remover, maybe. All right, be careful with your your food dye, your blue food dye. Um, so, to make Nicola Blue, the factory adds blue coloring to it, okay? There you go, Nicola Blue. And actually, that's maybe even bluer than it needs to be. I like the way it looks, though. So, let's talk about what Nicola Blue tastes like. Okay, here's the thing. You saw me eat that thing. We don't like violet candies, but this is good. It's balanced against that other syrup. It's lengthened with uh, seltzer. And also the act of taking those candies and cooking them into sugar turned down the volume on the violet a lot. It is still very violet, but it's not overpowering. You know, it doesn't it permeate your senses. It also still has a little bit of the citrus notes and a little bit of the bitter notes of the Nicola Classic Syrup. And honestly, when I think about all that's going on here, this might be my favorite of the Nicola beverages that I made. I, I'm pretty happy with all of them, but the blue one, honestly, might have the best evolution of the bunch. I made all the soft drink versions. Right after this, we're going to make the David Martinez. We're back! And I went and got my glass from the afterlife. That's a fun story. The CD Projekt Red sent me this as a gift when I did the Johnny Silverhand and then they took the actual design of my drink and made it the model in game, which is, it was a small tweak. It was very cool though. I mean, I'm, I'm in the game. <laughs> I think I forgot to use it when I did the Jackie Wells, honestly. So I'm glad I got it out here. Here's the deal. We're gonna make this drink. This is the David Martinez from Cyberpunk Edge Runners. So named for the main character, David Martinez, who runs around with a San Devastan doing all kinds of crazy shit. That drink in the game, the recipe that's given, a shot of vodka and a splash of neat cola on, on the rocks. The thing is, the image for it, it's very blue and there's yellow floating in it, gold floating in it. And what's funny is I was thinking, vodka isn't blue, vodka isn't yellow. How do I get that yellow thing in it? And I built this drink and I said, it needs a lemon twist. Oh, there's the yellow thing. <laughs> It's like, so dumb. Uh, and then the garnish for it is a katana with like a snake wrapped around it. I saw like um, somebody on a Reddit post saying, uh, it's just a, a vodka soda with a chili pepper garnish. And I could see why they thought that because from like a tiny little bit mappy thing, it kind of just looks like the snake coil just sort of looks like two purplish reddish chili peppers. But if you blow that up a lot, you can see that it is in fact a snake. I don't have a cool snake. I ordered some cool snakes. I don't know when Etsy's gonna deliver. We're, we're going snakeless. We're going no snake. It's gonna be fine. And so what I need is one ounce of this rapidly coagulating violet syrup. Use violet flowers, use a violet extract if you have time. Don't go buying Choward's violet candies because there's some kind of caking agent in them that you cannot stop. You can't stop. <laughs> Might be good to stop grievous bleeding. You know, it was serious bodily wound. You might be able to stop it with powdered Choward's violets. That'd be a very cyberpunk thing. Half an ounce of Nicola Original. Two ounces of vodka. We're gonna use Gary's good vodka. Yes, yeah, the vodka of the moment. We do want that to be blue, so I'm gonna add one or two drops of blue devil food dye that's just spraying me with food dye. 
I'm going to kind of dry stir that just to incorporate them without any ice. It's a shame that it's like clouding up like this. It was totally clear when it came off the stove and that's not quite blue enough. So I'm gonna add a couple more drops because I really want it to look like the picture in the game. That's blue. Uh, you know, this is the alcoholic version, right? So I could have used blue curacao or something, right? The thing of it is, is that I want all of the parts that are the soda to be non-alcoholic. So now I need an ice cube three ounces of carbonated water. This drink needs a twist of lemon over the top of it to be complete. Really needs that extra little jazz with lemon. Boom, very nice. And then that one isn't big enough, so I cut another big piece of peel. I'm going to put it through this neat little katana pick I have. There we go. There we have the David Martinez, as I imagine it must be served at the afterlife in Cyberpunk 2077, Edge Runner's Netflix show. Here we go. That's lovely. It's floral and fizzy and alcoholic. The twist of lemon, that's a really big factor in this drink. It's almost like an old fashioned because that, that sets off the violet so well. You need that twist of citrus, uh, particularly in an alcoholic beverage. It just, it, it wakes it up. It adds another dimension to that floral nature. I know it doesn't look like much, that little bit of oil, but boy, does it do a lot in a drink like this, you know? And the violet is unique. It's novel. I don't know. I can't think of any other drinks that are violet. There's creme de violet. You don't use it a lot. Why didn't I use it here? Again, because the blue in this drink, the violet flavor is coming from a soft drink. It's not coming from the alcoholic component. The only alcoholic component that should be in this drink is the vodka. So says the game. Well, if you're ready to chip into this whole cyberpunk thing and dive deep on the net, you're going to go back in time with past Greg talking about cyberpunk while future Greg stands here and enjoys a lovely David Martinez. What do you think, think, think cyberpunk is? It's a role-playing, a tabletop role-playing game. Look at you, look at you. But I meant like as a concept, as a genre. Dungeons and Dragons tends to be more like medieval. It's fantasy. Fantasy. Yeah. So this I assume to be more like 80s fantasy. 80s sci-fi is where, yeah. I mean, well, cyberpunk is a genre that predates the game, right? Like cyberpunk came out, the game came out in 1988, but really, the, the Locus Point, the seminal cyberpunk works, came out exactly at the same time. Blade Runner and Neuromancer, the movie Blade Runner, the, the book Neuromancer. So they both basically were kind of attacking the same issue at the same time. I think of cyberpunk as being actually an extension of the track that Film Noir was on. So I read a really cool book about Film Noir theory, which was like, look, Film Noir is about an interloper. There's a detective trying to find some external threat to themselves. They're trying to figure out who's the bad guy. That's noir, right? Neo-noir, which picks up right after Touch of Evil. That's, who am I? Trying to find yourself, figure out yourself. I would say actually the conversation is a great neo-noir. There is a external mystery in it, but like ultimately it's about Harry and like his own relationship to himself. And then cyberpunk, which is the next thing is that of that, is asking the question, kind of an elaboration on that, is free will real? Do we have free will? Am I actually in control or am I just a serious, is my thought process an illusion? And the reason, this is going to get real heady here, the reason that that's what cyberpunk is about is because cybernetics are not implants. That's not what a cyber, we say a cybernetic implant and now cyborg or cybernetic is like sort of synonymous with like robotic hands and stuff, but there's actually no reason that a prosthetic robotic hand has to be cybernetic. So cybernetics is a field of science and study that goes back, uh, modern cybernetics, they track back to the like early 1700s. And the word cybernetic, so it comes from the Greek kyber, which is a word for a boat's rudder, a rudder, because it's a controlling thing. And so what cybernetics as a field of study concerns itself with is the cybernetic feedback loop. And that is a sensor which can sense its environment, which is connected to a controller, which controls its environment, which senses the environment, which controls the environment, senses. So the quintessential cybernetic device that we all interact with every day is the thermostat. It controls the temperature of your house. It senses the temperature of your house. It controls the temperature. It senses the temperature. So this field of cybernetics kind of comes to a head in the 60s or early 70s when there's like, I think it's at Stanford, this is a big symposium and I forget the guy's name. He's like head dog, top dog in the field of cybernetics. And he gets up there and he's like, look, we've been, we've been working on this whole thing for a long time. We've been really studying cybernetics. We have built really complicated neural networks of cybernetic loops, right? And these are all analog. 
So they're not like ones and zeros, but like, and then you talk about like an analog computer, like the, it has infinite levels of gradation, right? So they're very complicated cybernetic loops. Um, and we've come to the conclusion that there is no self. Your personality, your identity, the things you want, the things we do, like we can do that. We can make a machine that experiences all of those things. A machine with no quote thinking parts in it at all, just a really large interconnected neural network of cybernetic loops. And that probably that's what we are. That like everything that you think you are, your personality, yourself, is not really there. It's an illusion that you're experiencing as you respond to an environment filled with external stimuli and a bajillion new loops. And if we could perceive all those loops, we could actually predict every single thing you would do from birth to death. It could be predicted. And that gets into like Last Lace's demon or whatever it's called. And actually what happened is that like a bunch of other people were like, that's really weird. Let's found a new field called computer science and get the hell out of here. <laughs> like that's literally what happened. There was like a rift between in the field of cybernetics and like computer science went one way and cybernetics just kind of became philosophers. So yeah, like a mechanical prosthetic does not need to be cybernetic. To be cybernetic, it would have to, I guess it would have to like feel. It would have to have a sense of touch so that it could, or some ability to perceive its environment yeah. and control its environment. One of the, the, the if you have anybody's interested in this deep divey stuff, there's a thing called the homeostat where they took these four, I think World War II era British bomb sites. And this experiment was done in like the fifties. I don't even understand it. I've seen pictures of it, but like basically they had pools of water with veins in it that could control waves in the water and which could detect the waves in the water. And all four of these things were connected to each other and they were all reading each other's waves and compensating for them back and forth to keep the water flat. So you would jostle it and whatever and be like, it would just fix it. Yeah, and so people saw this thing working and they were like, oh shit, it's alive. Like immediately, like you saw it and it was like, that's an animal, what happened here? Uh, and it was described as the closest thing to a thinking machine in any era by the press. And then there's something called Game of Life. Not the stupid board game with the wheel. I can't remember, it's a mathematician invented it. It's a set of rules and you can change the rules and get different results where you have this grid of squares. And if a grid is filled, it's alive. And if it's empty, it's, you know, it's not alive. And you have rules where it's like, well, they don't like to be alone. So if a grid is filled on its own, for example, it will die. But if there's more than there should be here, then some of them start dying off because there's not enough food to go around. And what they found was once they set up all these rules, if you set up a little pattern, like a certain pattern, it started to move across the screen and it would eat anything that came in its path and consume it and then the thing would get bigger and then there was another pattern they call them guns that would produce little bits repeatedly it would move around in a circle and boop and then the thing would come flying out of it or gliders and stuff like that and so there's all these game of life creatures that they found and they're looking at it and they're like this is indistinguishable from cellular life you know and that's how you get to this conclusion of like we aren't more than just a set of rules dictating our actions so cyberpunk as a genre really is concerned with, do I even exist? What is my level of free will here? And if you look at Blade Runner, if you look at uh, Neuromancer, and I don't want to spoil Neuromancer because the twist at the end of the book is kind of a big deal. And honestly, I think a lot of people read right past it and they don't get it, but like, it's very much at the end of the day about do humans have any control over what they do and what they think, or do they have free will? Neuromancer, the whole, I mean, Blade Runner, the whole question, if you're watching the movie and paying attention, Deckard, is he, does he even exist before the first frame? You know, if he's a replicant, there's a school of thought that says like, Deckard gets turned on at that noodle bar with all those implanted memories. And that's, he doesn't exist before then. And so, you know, what is a person, right? Um, or am I a person? Or is there anything that's like a person that you could even be, you know, do, is that just an imaginary idea? Would you step out for a few moments, Rachel? She's a replicant, isn't she? She doesn't know. She's beginning to suspect, I think. Suspect? How can it not know what it is? So that's actually the, I think that's the section, the thing that's at the core of cyberpunk. It's not actually, there is an aesthetic. There's a cyberpunk aesthetic of neon street samurais and all that stuff. But like an aesthetic isn't a genre, right? That's just dress up. Um, cyberpunk has like some real things to say and questions that are real to ask about society and humanity. And I think that's really cool to me. Okay, that's my great big <laughs> TED talk on cyberpunk as a genre. I feel like a way to do this, because it is a very long interlude before the drink, but I feel like you could be like, 
for the real nerds, stick around for the end, and we can just put that whole yeah. thing at the end. Yeah, sure. There it is. David Martinez uh, as served in Cyberpunk 2077, the video game based on the character David Martinez from Cyberpunk Edge Runners hit anime show on the Netflix. The Netflix, they got the animes over there. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, I have made two other drinks from Cyberpunk 2077. I did the Johnny Silverhand, which actually my version wound up in the game. I don't want to toot my own horn, but I gotta, someone's got to toot it. And uh, the Jackie Wells as well, which did not make up and make it into the game. But um, I'll put those up here and then some other stuff that you might have missed on HGD because I've been making the show for six years for so daggone long. I am on Twitch, Twitter, Instagram, Patreon, where you can support the show and find things that didn't make it into the edit, and TikTok, okay? And I will see you all soon on another episode of HTD. Thank you guys for hanging out with me. Good night, good luck, and uh, stay frosty, tunes.